Hi, my name is David Hester, and I've been a member of the studio for quite a while, and Nori's letting me introduce this series on the Alt P. Brock Club approach number one to interpreting primary source materials of P. Brock. What we've gone through is a series of five rules, potential six that I'll touch upon perhaps today. Um, series of five rules that I've used and developed over time as concrete guidelines to help get to the music behind the notes, the song behind the score. Primary sources are imperative. Get to them. Number two, Pibroch is a class of music with multiple genres, its impact is going to be upon the tempo that you will select for the tune in question. The third thing is getting back to the music. And to do so, we eliminate the cadences when we're trying to learn the tune to get at the themal notes, and we allow the krahanen to be more flexibly approached, not as echo beats, but to fit into the Dominant contextual rhythmic structure. Rule five. Pibach is a series of variations on a theme. We've been talking primarily about how to get back to the core theme and allow it to inform our performance of the Orlar. But what do we do after that? We have a whole bunch of variations. What do we know about those variations? Well, there are tools and there are turlas, and there are kronlas, and there are triplet variations, and there are terlas gear variations, and there are mach variations. There are a lot of variations that are available to us. When we visit the primary sources, what we see is there isn't really a set order to the variations. Many of these variation styles that we have um, available to us don't show up at all, and some just show up once or twice. Others seem to show up all the time, but their order isn't set. I have one example for, um, of an Orlar doubling existent just before a Kronoloth takes place. Variations were tools in the hand of the performer that allowed the performer to judge just how long a performance should go and how creative he or she could be. They were able to do this because of one very significant fact that no longer exists today, that Urlar's always were played after a cycle of motions. So, what do I mean by a cycle of motions? Well, by a motion, a motion is a variation. We call them motions at the LP Brock Club primarily because that's what they were called. They were called shul, which means to move. And we see that term motion in our earliest um, P. Brock notational system, namely Kelling Campbell's Cantorock, Netherland Cantorock, first motion. Didn't call it a variation, called it first motion, second motion. Motions of a particular style create a cycle. Why is it a cycle? Because you play an Orlar, you go through, for example, a Terraloth, and then a Terraloth doubling, and marry a Terraloth tripling in order to return back to the Orlar. That sets you up for the next cycle of motions. Krenloth, Krenloth doubling, Krenloth tripling, and back to the Orlar. The only cycles we have today are the Orlar in the beginning and the Orlar in the end. And the problem with this is that sets these motions is a series of finger exercises to be performed one after the other, with no break. You 
but we know, as Donald McDonald stated, as the chorus is to a song, so the orlar is to a bebop tune. But once you introduce the orlar as a refrain, that explains why cycles of motions appear at different points than the, what we have today as a series of progressively more complicated finger exercises. You can see in those early manuscript traditions that no, actually, some of these cycles came at unexpected places and times. How could they do that? Because they had the framework of an orlar to continue to return to throughout the course of the performance. I'm suggesting we return the return of the orlar. We return to the return of the orlar. J.G. Dial was the aristocratic producer of entertainments at the Leith Games, at the Leith um, um, horse racing annually, and put on the first big Scottish Highland entertainment spectacles. And he was constrained by a number of factors. One, it had to be, what he pulled off had to be very entertaining, had to be brisk, had to take on a whole lot of Pibroch players, but not just Pibroch players, there were interludes of other things taking place. It all had to be done on time, and it all had to be something that people wanted to come back to, and he set a rule, don't do the Orlar returns. The performers rebelled, but like anything else, like any other competitor, if you don't play by the rules, you can't play. And the performers just sucked it up and did it. And ever since then, we've lived without all our refrains. Well, they'll take too long to play. How much time do you spend screeching on high A on the boards to tune your instruments? You spent 20 minutes in a room trying to tune the thing, and now you're going to spend another five to ten minutes tuning on the boards, the amount of time you spend tuning on the boards, disrespecting your audiences, that time would be better filled by the very pleasant performance of an orlar in between cycles of variations. It's a false dichotomy. If you've never played an orlar return, try it now. It is a remarkable experience as a player and a remarkable experience as an audience. For a player, what it does is it gives you a break. It lets you plan the next series of variations. It gives you a sense of home. It gives you a sense of journey, a journey of cycles. And it's a remarkable thing. And it informs the next set. Oh, yeah, this is the tune. How do I want to make this tune sound with terawatts? How do I want to make this sound with terawatt gears? How do I want to make this sound with cremelots? It keeps reminding you of what it is that you're riffing off of in this variation. It's mind opening. And it's not going to cost you all that much time, truth be told. So that's rule number five.